So what we're going to do right now is review hypothesis testing questions and how we should be approaching them, what are the different things that we should be thinking of to, disrupt the, to deconstruct the question by asking ourselves a number of different things. So first we have, how do we know it's a hypothesis test question? Well, we look for different keywords like run a hypothesis test, look for claim, maybe level of significance, maybe something as simple as somebody wants to test something. We then have to determine what kind of random variable we have. And remember, we have two random variables, means and proportions. Once we figure out what the random variable is, we want to know and look for, well, what's the population information? In other words, what are the population parameters? So for means, we have the center, mu, and they spread, sigma. And when sigma is known, we would be using a, t a z test to do that analysis. For means again, we have our center mu and our sigma again, but this time if the sigma is unknown, we'd need to use a t-test. And just so that you know, we're not going to be doing t-test for, for this particular topic. And for proportions, we'd have p, our population proportion, and q, our population failure. So remember the p and q from the, come from the binomial formula, or binomial model, I should say. So p is the probability of success, q the probability of failure. And again, that would be a z-test. We will then have to look for our sample information because we're going to be testing something against the population. So in other words, we would have to take some kind of sample. So we'd need an n, and we'd also need a sample value. So for means, we'd have a sample mean, x bar, and we'd have our sample size, n. And for proportions, we have a sample p, and this could be in a ratio, and then a sample q and a sample n. And remember, our sample proportion should have a p hat and the sample q, q hat. We would then want to look for and figure out what's our given or our desired or chosen level of significance. And remember, alpha is our little Greek symbol for the level of significance. And if we recall from confidence intervals, 1 minus alpha is our confidence level. We would then need to determine what our critical test statistics are. And remember that is based on what our chosen or given alpha value is. We would look up our critical test statistic on our Z or T tables. And again, for our purposes, we'll just use the Zs. We would then need to determine what kind of test are we doing. And we have three types of tests, a less than test. So we'd have one critical test statistic there in the negative area. And keywords would be less than, has decreased, or smaller than. We could have a greater than test. And again, we'd have one critical test statistic where it would be a positive value. And again, we'd have different keywords like greater than, has increased, larger than, or more than. We also have our third type of test, which is a not equal to test, or sometimes called a change or difference test. That would have the not equal to symbol in it. And here we'd have our two critical test statistics, one negative and one positive. And for a not equal to test, what we're really saying is that something could be maybe larger or smaller, and that both those occurrences are undesirable or bad. We'd have to then formulate, well, what are our hypotheses? What is it we're actually trying to test? So again, it's going to be based on the type of test we're doing. And remember, the null hypothesis has the equal symbol in it and the population parameter and population value in it. And it's what currently is the status quo or what is generally accepted right now. The alternative to hypothesis, HA, is going to have the different type of test we're running, less than, greater than, or not equal to. And it will also have the population parameter and the population value in it. We'd have to figure out what model we're, being, we're going to be using. And that's going to be based on our random variable. So for means, if we know sigma, we'll use the sampling distribution of means. So there's our shape, center, and spread, as we've seen before. And there's our formula for Z calculated. For means, and remember, we're not going to be responsible for this one for this term. If sigma is unknown, then we have our sampling distribution of means again. But this time around, the difference is, is instead of sigma, we have our sample standard deviation. And we'd have a t calculated. But again, remember, we're not going to be doing that for this term. And for proportions, we have sampling distribution of proportions with our shape, center, and spread as before, and our z calculated. 
we would then look into what decision rules are we going to be using. And for our course, we're going to be using our two approaches, critical value approach, which is the more classical or um, old school type approach, if you prefer. And what we do with that is that we compare or we locate the Z calculated to the Z critical. And we figure out what the Z calculated is. Is it in the reject H naught region? Or is it in the fail to reject H naught region? Our other approach is the p-value approach. And the p-value approach is based on that if the p-value, remember, which is a probability value, is small enough, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. In sort of an expression format, if the p-value is less than the alpha value, we reject H naught. And remember, these are not subtraction symbols here. It's just a dash for the name. And then finally, what would we write for a conclusion statement? So just like a confidence interval statement, there's going to be three components of a good conclusion statement. At some level of significance, so here we'd put our value of alpha that we were either given or chosen. There is either enough or not enough evidence to reject H naught. And different terminology for enough and not enough, you could say sufficient or insufficient. And then it appears that, and this is where we would have to have some writing here to describe what is being concluded. And that's going to depend on the particular question. Now this is very prescriptive for those of us who are just first learning hypothesis testing. There's many ways to write a hypothesis test conclusion statement, but this is one of the basic ways of doing it, quoting the level significance, saying whether you're either going to, uh, you have enough evidence to reject H naught or not enough evidence to reject it and then make some type of culminating statement. So hopefully that's helping you out a little bit and if you take a look at some of the examples I have posted hopefully that's going to make some sense for you. Thanks.